Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics, and I'm answering questions, and the new one I'm going to answer now is, what is the process to measure room decay time? I'm very familiar with REW, but confused about the process. Do you sweep just one speaker full range, speaker and sub bass manage, etc., average five to six measurements? I see a lot of smart people discuss this topic, but none seem to elaborate much about their methodology. It's a good question, and I shot a whole video to do, and then I screwed something up in the video and had never published it on how to do this. So let me just go through the process. Um with the room a little bit here. So I'm sitting in my main listening position. So the standard way that it should be done, if you want to stay consistent to the industry standard method for RDT or RT60 measurements, keep in mind, there is no official standard for a home theater. This is just room measurements. You're supposed to use a dodecahedron speaker. In large concert halls, you need a dodecahedron speaker. It's an omnidirectional speaker. In small rooms like this, they've actually done research where they've, they've done that. And what they found is that a uh, typical monopole speaker gives the exact same results as an omnidirectional speaker. So you don't need a dodecahedron speaker. What you need, though, is at least two speakers or two speaker locations. Even with the dodecahedron, you would take a series of measurements and move the speaker and take another series of measurements. So you're going to do the same concept here. So I'm just going to say use your left and right speaker. It's the easiest. If you want to do something else, it's fine. You want to do your left speaker and your right rear surround, that's good too. It doesn't really matter, but you're going to use two different speakers because you want the source coming from two locations. So let's just keep it simple, left, right. You do not do left plus right. I've seen people do that. Not a good idea. If there's any delay between the two, then obviously one speaker is going to decay in the room over a longer period of time than the other one because you're going to have the first one come in and decay. The second one comes in a little bit later and decays. The RT60 time that gets uh, calculated from that now has been artificially extended. So only one speaker location at a time. Left speaker. Now, do you use the subwoofer or not? So that in there. It should be full bandwidth. When you do the decahedron one, you put a subwoofer on it, you mount them together, and that's a part of it. Otherwise, you can't measure the low frequencies. However, it's going to give you bad results if the subwoofer is not time aligned with the main speakers. And most of you probably don't have your subwoofers time aligned with your main speakers. You probably have them phase aligned if you've bothered to calibrate them, but you probably don't have them time aligned. I actually just calibrated a system where we used Arc. It was Arc Genesis, and at the end of the whole thing, we ran the phase alignment where it goes and it does like left speaker subwoofer, uh, center speaker subwoofer, right speaker subwoofer and it keeps doing that to try to get each of the subwoofers time aligned with the speakers and it makes all these adjustments and it iterates through it and then it gives you these results and i was curious how good a job it was going to do i've done this before but i hadn't looked at it super carefully and then um, in this case i had some time to really look through the data uh, taken with rew um, it made it four cycles off so it was phase aligned yes but it was four cycles off it was not time aligned so again that's going to cause problems so if you're going to do this with subwoofers, if it's not time aligned, it's not going to be the absolute end of the world, but there are going to be some accuracy issues at the low frequencies. My recommendation, however, would be to try to make sure your subwoofers are as time aligned with the main speakers as possible before you go through this whole effort. Personally, I think it's a good idea to do that anyway. You want it to be time aligned and phase aligned. So with a time aligned and phase aligned base managed speaker, left one, measure in the MLP, measure in the right seat, measure in the left seat, measure in the back seat. In my room, take six, eight measurements. Now, do you average them? I would say yes and no. What I would do is first look at all of them individually. And I usually make a chart um, that shows all of them together. And it, what I look for is consistency. Consistency between the frequencies. So you want to see that at any one position, you have a relatively flat RDT time for each seat. And that it's consistent across seats. So if it's 0.3 seconds here, it's also 0.3 seconds here. If it's 0.32, that's okay. But if it's 0.35, that's maybe not okay. It's a little too far off. If it's 0.29 here, that's okay. But if it's 0.22 here, maybe not okay. Things like that. Um, then the other thing that you're going to potentially do is some sort of averaging of these. Now, there's different ways to do this. And you have to be careful. If all your measurements were collected in a perfectly time-aligned way, not using a timing reference beep, but actually proper loop back with, and actually the way I do it is I set up four microphones and I use a four mic array and I use the uh, four, four, four mic interface, I mean, and I use the multi-channel measurement system. So those are perfectly time aligned when you do that with a loop back. So I get four and then I can get eight and then I can time align just 
basically the two groups together, which is a little bit easier to do. Then you can do a vector average. And then from the vector average, you can calculate like the T60M. I prefer T60M to the other RDT or, or you know, RT60 type measurements, but um, there are others like TOPT that are pretty good too. Uh, you can also use T30, not bad, and T20, but I think T60M is the most accurate in small rooms. So that's my preference. Use that, in my opinion. Then when you get the vector average of all of them and you calculate T60M, that's like a spatially average T60M. However, if there are any issues and it's not properly time aligned uh, and you don't have enough bandwidth in the measurement, uh, in term, in term, including temporally, there needs to be the, the window actually needs to be widened to do that then the problem you can run into is that's not very accurate. So what you can do instead is just output those to Excel, the individual positions, and then average those in Excel. And that's also a spatially averaged measurement. Now you're just averaging the values instead of getting an average from the, you know, the vector average, which is the temporal average from the impulse response, which itself is spatially averaged. You could argue whether one's more, I've actually compared them. They hardly ever vary very much from each other. It's just easier to do it all in, uh, uh, REW than it is to have to ex export it to Excel. But I have had issues with a single microphone taking all those measurements, especially if it's like a USB mic, which most of you are probably using, and then time aligning those and then doing the vector average because then the frequency response is clearly wrong when I do the vector, vector average. And then when you take a T60, it's wrong. Uh, for the window, you probably are all using like the standard window widths. And I forget exactly what the values are, but it's like, you know, I don't know, 500, 500. You need to extend the right side window to something larger, like a thousand, because otherwise what happens when you vector average them is it's going to truncate it and it's going to make the T60 values a bit off because the decay times are wrong at the highest frequency. So that's actually kind of important. Let's see if I missed anything. Yeah. And how many measurements, by the way, it really depends on the seating area. What we care about is consistency across the seating area. If you have one seat, I still would take a couple around the seat, but like you don't have to go too crazy. Uh, never take a measurement that's any closer than around one to one and a half meters to a wall. So even if your couch is in the back wall, don't measure at the couch then. Measure in front of the couch so that you're about one minimum of one meter from the wall. Otherwise, what happens is that there's going to be a lot of low frequency energy buildup off of the wall, and it's going to give you an inaccurate decay time uh, for the room. Uh, the other thing you could do if you want to, it's just more work, and I don't know how useful it is, is you could just measure, you could sample the whole room. So what you do is create a grid, a spatial grid at about two to three different heights. So you've got like, let's say a little bit below head height, around head height, and the same amount as you are below. Let's say you're a foot below, go a foot above, or two feet below, go two feet above. And you start maybe, bend, like my room, you could start about four or five feet out from the speakers themselves and then measure in two foot increments as you get back. That would end up generating a ton of measurements, but it would give you a better assessment of the whole sound field overall and how the decay time is varying. Now, think something to keep in mind when you're doing all this. At low, anything below around 150, 200 hertz is gonna start to be suspect. There's a lot of things that influence it that have nothing to do with the actual decay time of the room. Room modes are the most dominant you're going to see a lot of variation if you don't have good control of room modes in your room at low frequencies. So if you do see a lot of variation, it is a sign that you need to acoustically treat the room. But keep in mind that what's dominating that is probably room modes. And remember that just because, you know, you calculated your Schroeder frequency maybe to be 80 hertz, that that doesn't mean there's no modes above 80 hertz. What really happens is there's this transition point that sort of marks, roughly speaking, the point at which you go from a lot of bunched up modes that overlap to a lot of discrete, widely spaced modes. But what it really looks like when you really analyze the data, and this, this is a good way to look at that data, is discrete modes which become more and more widely spaced. So at the lowest frequency, you've got the zeroth mode, that's DC. You've got the first mode in like my room, it's I think 21 hertz. Then you're gonna have your second and your third and your fourth mode, which are gonna show up in the 30 to 50 hertz range. And then you're gonna start to see those modes pile up on top of each other where you're at like maybe the 20th mode and it's like, I don't know, 80 hertz and then the 87 hertz and then 90 hertz. Like you're getting really close. They're starting to pile up on top of each other. You're going to continue to have discrete modes though, all the way well up to two, 300 hertz. So your RDT time is affected by that because if you've got a null, a big cancellation null, then the decay time is immediate. 
And if you've got a big peak in the response, the decay time is going to be forever. And so if your response looks like that and varies a lot around the room, the low frequency decay times that you're going to get from that are going to be very suspect. Spatially averaging them averages out the effects of the modes to a point, but that doesn't mean that you've addressed all the issues because what you've done is sort of, you've averaged, you basically come up with a number that's wrong, it's equally wrong everywhere, best way to put it. You don't really want to be equally wrong, right? You want to actually dive into the data. That's why I said, don't just average it, look at the individual stuff. So it's important to look at that. If you want to get into some sort of scientific method to do that, what I would do is probably calculate variance. Um, so basically what you're going to do, or a deviance score, you're going to look at, you're going to create a score that measures for each position how much it deviates from a particular uh, measurement, which is the average usually. could be the MLP if you prefer, but what I recommend is to do the average. So how much does it deviate from the average? The higher that score is, the bigger of an issue it is. And uh, that way you can start to zero in on which places in your room have the biggest problems that are affecting varied decay, typically caused by these modes. What do you do about all that? Well, it's room treatment, base traps, really. And remember, base traps could still be just regular velocity traps, depending if it might be in the upper base range. So like just maybe you have two inch absorbers, go to four inch absorbers, go to six inch absorbers, something like that. If it's at lower frequencies, like much below 100 hertz, 150 hertz, you're not going to get a lot of benefit from the from the fuzz. It's just going to require too much, too thick. So you're going to have to get into specially tuned base traps. And I'm not, I recommend, you know, like I use the steel front base traps or membrane base traps, something like that. Did I cover everything? All right. And at the beginning, I said you have to do two speakers. So when you take all those measurements with the left speaker, you got to do it all over again with the right speaker or the side surround speaker or the back one. Some of you might be thinking like, well, I'm going to be extra fancy and extra scientific and I'm going to do every speaker. You're welcome to do that if you want to. I highly doubt you're going to get any extra information out of it. Uh, the reason why you're having the two different speakers go is that it just helps to give you a better sense of how the room gets lit up depending on the location of the source. In a well-designed room, it shouldn't matter. The room should essentially light up the same uh, regardless. So again, you're just looking at variance. Those deviant scores are a great way to assess that. If you want to do that across every speaker in your room, like I said, have at it. I, you're not, I don't think you're generating a lot more useful information. You get to a certain point where you've covered 95% of what you need to know, and that remaining 5% is just unimportant. But if you're that bored and you need to spend your time doing something, go for it. So I hope these uh, answers are, are helpful and you appreciate it. I know I got to do a video on how to do this, and I promise you I will. Uh, I just got to get my act together. So thanks for watching.